child that was sleeping with her brothers was kidnapped. This is the version of the crime we got used to accept as the only possible. But is it the true one? Or does this version conceal a crime that many want to hide? We have a very strong sighting that Madeleine McCann was seen in Morocco 12 days ago. On Sunday, we had another offer of more than a million pounds. The reaction from the dog over here, where his head's up in the air. This is all investigation. What we are preparing was never done before. We took the former police judiciary coordinator, Gonzalo Moral, to the crime scene to show us what happened to Madeleine McCann. This reenactment will allow us to know who spoke the truth and who didn't. We will know what happened the night Maddy disappeared forever. Strangely, the investigation was never able to reenact all that happened. Aquilo que sei, diz-me que Madeleine McCann morreu no apartamento 5A no dia 3 de maio de 2007. Tenho a certeza que esta verdade um dia será apurada. A investigação foi brutalmente interrompida e houve um arquivamento político e precipitado. Há quem esconda a verdade, mas mais tarde ou mais cedo, o verniz vai estalar e as revelações vão surgir. Só então haverá justiça para Madeleine McCann. Well, hi everyone and welcome once again to our Saturday evening live featuring Maddie and hoping one day that we'll get justice for her. But uh, I want to thank uh, Joanna Moray for that in uh, that preview. She did a lot of work on the translations and in fact was one of them that translated the uh, Gonzalo book uh, sorry, not the book, the documentary that we'll be featuring today. So anyway, thank you. And thank you, Shirley, for being here, as always. She's on mute. I am on mute. <laughs> it's, it's better to stay on mute and then have to take a couple seconds to unmute it than the other way around. So, well, thank you for, yeah. for having me here. I'm excited about this one. I'm excited about this. Show. Yes. Yes, I, I'm really excited. There's a few things we're going to address um, before I do. Of course, I want to thank everybody for being here and also to the mods for doing, always being there, checking everybody, making sure we don't get any anything strange in chat. It's an odd word, but that's it. And Carrie, of course, who always is there just passing on those links for everybody. So I'm really excited because there's a few things I want to address apart from the book. Um, but first of all, I want to go a bit off topic because I want to wish my lovely sister a happy birthday. 82 today, so still as beautiful as the day she was born. Just look at her. And I have to say, after 71 years, I don't really recall any aggro between us. Now, there may have been, and I've forgotten, but there is one issue, Anne, if you're watching, that she cut my hollyhocks. I mean, can you believe it? I was seven years old, and she cut my hollyhocks. I was so upset. <laughs> But anyway, that, as far as I can remember, is really the only dispute we've had in 71 years. So once again, happy birthday, Anne. 82 today, and you wouldn't believe it just by looking at her. And also to my niece, her daughter, Christine, who was, uh, her birthday was yesterday. In fact, my sister wanted to have a baby before she was 21, and she had her the day before. So that's, that's quite good. So, okay, well, once again, happy birthday, Anne, but I better move on. <laughs> so a few things that we're going to discuss today uh, is um, last week <laughs> I had a name that I could not remember, and it was Super Injunction. So 
looking at it again, I realized how important this is. Because if a super injunction is imposed upon a case like this, then not only is uh, the media or anybody able to refer to the um, details in the injunction, they cannot even refer to the actual injunction. They can't refer to the fact that there is one. So this is very suspicious, and I'll show you why a little bit later. But before we start, there's something I really, really need to address. And in the Maddie case, as many of you know, we have never chosen to make any money from the case. It's all of us, just about all of us over the last 13 or more years have researched and done everything we could to get justice for Maddie, never never ever looking for any kind of payment. I mean, it's just not accepted in the Maddie community. But along came one person who not only started to make money, he makes a huge amount of money from his Patreon and PayPal and everything else. And this is not just with the Maddie case, this is with another case also. So I wanted to address it because last night he is claiming that he is the world export, export, expert on Maddie. He's written a book, a so-called book, and that is quite a stretch, to be honest, because this book was merely a compilation of his posts that many, many, many people tried to put into, to edit it. I don't think, I don't think they ever succeeded because it was so difficult. And I have actually seen uh, what was uh, supposedly the book. It's not a book that I would even close to recommend. And I also, for anybody who is looking at the Madeline case, please keep in mind that this person is making a lot of money from it, and that is totally against our Maddie guidelines. Now, here is something to show you what's happened with him. I'm Chair Detective. So, as you can see, if you look at uh, uh, my... Um, graphic here. You can see down here, over the 14 years that I've had, well, actually, it was from 2011, my YouTube channel. So that was nine, uh, 10 years. Never a penny. Never a penny. Um, and nobody else has made any money from it because we have a passion for the case. That's why I'm here today. And my passion is not only because of uh, just being here. The reason I'm here is thanks to Chris and Kim, who really, really inspired me. So thinking of you. Anyway, so when he declared last night that he's looking to have this book published and was looking for somebody one of his uh, admin to go to the, you know, to look in the States to try and have it published. Please, please, please be aware that this is pie in the sky. It will never be published. It's not even suitable for um, anybody to actually bother reading and gain anything from it. He broke the rule of not making money with, uh, in the Maddie community. And we actually, didn't welcome him. We, we no longer welcome him in the Maddie community. And when I see him claiming all the things he does about Madeline and what he knows, which is very general, to be honest, um, we find it disrespectful and outrageous to gain financially based on young victims of a crime. He's using the Maddie case 
and the Watts case and currently making approximately $20,000 a month. Now, this is an estimate, goes up and down, but um, believe me, I've worked out there is proof of, of how close that is. And it's by manipulation, exaggeration, feeding his ego and lies. And apart from the Maddie case, I really want to see the truth about what he's doing come out. And I'm really hoping that maybe some of his subs will be seeing this or will see this and think, not telling anybody not to do anything, but please think for yourself and recognize what's happened. And certainly if you're interested in the Maddie case, please go to a reputable uh, creator who will show you the truth. So I think I should probably stop there on that issue. I did want to address it because of last night and his claims about making the book, which, believe me, is not going to happen. So let's move on from that. This... Oh, no, I was just going to say this... Uh, video is about Gonzalo Amaral's documentary. But before we do, I want to uh, go back to what I was talking about earlier about the super injunction. And this is absolutely something which I discovered. I don't think it's been discussed. It may not even be known by many. But if I can just show you, as I was going through the statements, I came across this comment during Diane Webster's rogatory interview. And of course, if I could read it closer, <laughs> um, the policeman interviewing her said, uh, also when we spoke earlier, you expressed a sense of frustration about the fact that you're all banned from the super in with a capital letter inaudible. And she said, that's right. Yes. Now, I don't know what else could be what he was saying, especially with super having a capital letter than injunction. And uh, he replies back, and you've been very restrained in what you say. And she says, yeah, yeah. Now, and in English uh, law, a super injunction is a type of injunction that prevents publication of information that is an issue and also prevents the reporting of the fact that the injunction exists at all. The term was coined by a Guardian journalist covering the Trafigura controversy. I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, what happened with Trafigua, there was, uh, I, I, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure of, of what happened, but it was a major, major case and it had a super injunction on it. Now, curiously, it was the same lawyers that the McCanns have, Carter Ruck. And uh, if you don't mind me just going over something here, which I think is really important, uh, what happened, Twitter managed to bring down the injunction and the effort to gag the newspaper. Trafigura's legal representation of the London-based law firm Carter Ruck had obtained a secret injunction. In September, to prevent The Guardian from revealing the existence of a report commissioned by the oil trader about the alleged 2006 dumping of toxic waste, waste off the Ivory Coast by a ship chartered by the company. The lawyers then tried to stop The Guardian from telling its readers about a written question lodged in Parliament this week by Paul Farrelly a Labour MP. He questioned mentioning both the secret injunction and the report. Now, The Guardian is prevented from identifying 
notifying the MP who has asked the question, what the question is, which minister might answer for it, or where the question is to be found. Wrote in the Guardian's David Lee in a historically obscure front page article on Tuesday. The Guardian is also forbidden from telling its readers why the paper is prevented for the first time in memory from reporting Parliament. Now, Trafigur and Carter Ruck did not take into account the power of Twitters, Twitterers. By dawn in Britain, the words Trafigur, Carter Ruck and Guardian often accompanied by the hashtag sign that enables Twitter users to click through and collect tweets on a tagged subject, began to crop up on the site, elbowing their way into the top 10 trending topics by mid-morning. And this is what is really, really took me aback because I thought if they could do it, for Trafigur. And if there is an injunction, super injunction on Madeline, who's to say that something similar doesn't happen or can't happen with Madeline? By lunchtime, the text was widely, sorry, I'm small writing, I'm having trouble reading it, <laughs> uh, widely circulated. Bloggers also supplied their interpretation of events. The comedian and avid Twitterer Stephen Fry galvanized his more than 800,000 followers into action with the following tweet containing links to two of the... Can't see my curses in the way. <laughs> two brief online reports of the legal bailiffs. At this stage, The Guardian was still unable to name Trafigura, shed further light on the kerfuffle, but the paper's editor, Alan Rushbridge, continued to lob his own carefully crafted tweets into the mix. Guardian, hoping to get into court today to challenge the ban by Carter Ruck on reporting Parliament, watch this space. He posted... He informed the Twitter verse that a court hearing was set for the afternoon. Then came two jubilant tweets. Victory, hashtag Carter Ruck caves in. No guarantee court hearing. Media can now report Paul Farrell's PQ about Trafigura. More soon on Guardian. And thanks to Twitter all tweeters for fantastic support over the past 16 hours, a great victory for free speech. Guardian, Trafigura, and Carter Ruck. So my first thought when I looked at the fact that Diane Webster had, or the, the policeman interviewing her, had mentioned the beginning of what looks to be the super injunction is this what is stopping everybody from talking about the Maddie case? The so-called cover-up, well, there is a cover-up, but is this why nobody can even refer to a super injunction? Is this why the T7 cannot speak? Their friends cannot speak. Nobody can speak. And they can't say, we can't speak because we're, we're banned. They can't even say that. They have to just remain silent. So is this why... The Maddie case is where it is, and nobody is able to actually point that out. And um, before we go on to um, Gonzalo's uh, documentary, there was something else just in reference to this that I find interesting. And I, I again, I haven't seen anybody else actually uh, post it or discuss it is the fact that um, the Tapper Seven have been, their lawyers have spoken out for them. And in the Daily Mail, I mean, going back to uh, 
November of 2007, Uh, claimed several things. And I find this interesting because this is something that not a lot of people realize, that uh, Madeleine McCann's parents faced alleged allegations today that they're pressuring their friends into keeping silent over the events surrounding their daughter's disappearance. Now, one of the Tapas Nine, who was dining with the couple on the night Madeleine vanished, is said to be feel obliged to be silent. Respected Spanish newspaper, El Monde, quoted an unnamed lawyer said to represent the friend, criticizing the McCann's advisors. The lawyer told the newspaper, now this is one of the friend's lawyers, my client feels obliged to keep silent about what he can do to help the investigation and not because of the Portuguese secrecy logs. This is very revealing about the strange circumstances surrounding this case. It's not that he is scared of the McCanns, but the economic and political lobby surrounding the couple is truly frightening to anybody. What my client wants is to reveal the whole truth. I mean, this, is, this to me is amazing. Because this is a question, excuse me, this is me talking. This to me is a question that we all ask. Why don't they speak out? And uh, this lawyer is saying it. And also, is, is are they under a super injunction not to be able to say anything? Uh, my client wants to reveal the whole truth, but he does not mean to accuse or blame anyone, as that is the job of the police. The only thing he wants is to help the police discover the truth about what happened before, during, and after that dinner on May the 3rd. Last week, El Mondo reported that lawyers acting for the two McCann's friends have contacted Portuguese police to say they wish to correct certain parts of their statements. Jerry and Kate McCann's spokesman, Clarence Mitchell, denied the report and said it was not true that any of the couple's friends wanted to change their stories. But the British lawyer, who, was, who has an office in London, told El Mundo, if you take into account that all of the pressure that has been placed on my client and on other people, it's perfectly natural and understandable that my client has not told Clarence Mitchell and his decision to hire his own lawyer to cooperate more closely with the police. Four of the Tapas Nine, Fiona Payne, Jane Tanner, Russell and Rachel Oldfield, and not pictured Matthew Oldfield, David Payne and Diane Webster. The lawyer also claimed that on the night of May the 3rd, the McCanns did not call the police until they had discussed the possible implications for them of having left their three children alone in the holiday apartment. The lawyer said the police were only informed after the group in question analyzed the problems they could face for having left the children alone. And until now, my client has not had the opportunity to talk for himself about it all. I'm just finding this just amazing. I mean, I, I, I hadn't really scrutinized it myself lately, and this is just, it aren't, I mean, it's just amazing. The lawyer, who's said to have been hired by the friend in September, was also critical of the help of the McCanns, having been given by the British authorities, and rightly so. Now, as most of you know, I, I deal with facts and I deal with the files. I deal with Gonzalo because he was the coordinator. He, he knows um, what he's talking about. Interviews, things that are factual. And I wouldn't normally totally believe um, a news article, but in this case, they are lawyers of the McCann's friends and they are quoted. And that's why this is so important, I believe. So <clears throat> uh, I understand that our government is legally obliged to help the McCanns. What I can understand is they have received help which goes far beyond 
what would be considered normal in a case like this. However, from the very beginning, it has been clear that the Madeline case is not a normal police case. It's not my job to have to explain why and how certain politicians have intervened in the case, but I'm afraid these interventions have been prejudicial, not only to my client, but also for determining the truth. My client has not received any personal support from the British authorities. And sorry, my phone was making funny noises. <laughs> Only that which has come through the McCann couple. I don't want to accuse anyone, but there are people very close to the McCanns who are not helping them at all. The intention of my client is to bring a light to the truth of this sad story without any concern for who might be implicated. Four of the Tappers Nine, the name given to J Jerry and Kate McCann and the seven friends, they were with during the night Madeline disappeared from the holiday complex in the Algarve, have repeatedly brought in their own lawyers as they prepared to be named as official suspects. Missing and at the center, oh, okay, that was probably under a, a photo. So now just this last one, and I'll just go over this. And I, I hope you find this as interesting, as important as I do in this case. Um, I didn't want to describe it. I think you needed to actually read the words from the lawyers to make it credible. Uh, the newspaper named the four as Russell O'Brien and his partner Jane Tanner Matthew Oldfield and Dr. David Payne. It claimed they had been warned they would join the McCanns and Robert Murat as our guidos after the discovery of Portuguese investigation of inconsistencies in key statements made immediately after Madeline vanished. Dr. Payne is a 41-year-old cardiovascular researcher from Leicester. He was the last person outside of the McCann family to see Madeline as Jerry asked him to check on his wife and children while he was having a tennis lesson about 6.30. Attention has also focused on Jane Tanner's claim she saw a man carrying a girl from the McCann's ground floor apartment at about 9.15 when another witness said he, he was outside at the... Uh, flat at the same time, but did not see her or the mystery man. Mr. Oldfield has said he re he entered by the McCann's, uh, he entered the McCann's apartment to check on the children about 30 minutes before Madeline was reported missing by her mum. He told police that although he had seen the McCann's two-year-old twins, Sean and Emily, the sister's bed was out of his sight line. Dr. O'Brien uh, from Exeter was away from the group for up to 45 minutes between 9.30 and 10.15 while he tended to his own child who was sick in his apartment. <clears throat> he told police he had changed her bed linen, but staff at the Ocean Club were said to have denied any change of sheets were requested. The McCanns and these friends have always denied any involvement in Madeline's disappearance and insists she was kidnapped. They are barred by strict Portuguese secrecy law and from speaking about the events of May the 3rd, but recently issued a, stream, a statement <laughs> denying they had a pact of silence or that they were covering up a secret. Portuguese police are preparing to send three-man team led by Chief Investigator Polo Rebello to the UK to interview the Tapas Nine. British detectives will ask questions put to them by their Portuguese counterparts. So that may, in my opinion, I don't know what everybody else thinks, but I think that really would be something that may explain 
why we're not hearing anything. It's, uh, hang on, I've just got to do something here. It, uh, why the secrecy? Why the pact of silence? I think uh, one of the newspapers phoned up uh, um, David Payne and uh, he claimed there was a pact of silence. Now, they were told to be uh, quiet about things regarding the Portuguese law and secrecy, but in actual fact, is there something far greater? And has Carter Ruck put a super injunction where no one is allowed to discuss the case and no one is allowed to say that this is happening and this is the reason they're not allowed to discuss the case just everybody has to keep quiet i don't know i think that may answer some questions so hopefully is there any questions on that that anybody's come up with before we move on to uh, to Gonzalo's I haven't seen, I haven't seen any we'll, we'll okay. give them a second if anybody puts any up though well it may be I mean just hearing listening to me droning on it it may may have been not of great interest but I did want to get the actual words out so that's okay we shall move on now to something which actually it kind of um, it's about Gonzalo's documentary which the McCanns did not want the UK to watch. It was broadcast in Portugal and would you know I can't think of the date exactly but it was broadcast in Portugal and prior to its uh, broadcast I had phoned up Nancy Grace's uh, producer on the Friday before and she was highly highly interested enough that she asked me specifically to send her links to this and links to that and details and over the weekend I did a huge um as simple as possible post or, or email for her to be able to uh, link to anything she wanted to regarding the case because the uh, the documentary was going to be on on the monday i think what was really weird is that 15 minutes before the documentary was coming on i sent her the email and i don't know i think it was about 10 minutes later I got this back. Uh, she said, oh, we're going to pass. I mean, that to me, yeah, it was April 2009. That to me, considering after my long phone call with her and she really, really, really wanted to know all the details, but put to Nancy, I guess, was a cutoff. Was this something to do because they knew there was a super injunction in place? Who knows? But anyway, that uh, that was really quite a shock after all the effort. It wasn't just because of the effort. I mean, I'd do it anyway, but yeah, I was shocked. And then I responded to her. And as you can see at the very bottom, uh, I'd put documentary on now. This is how how quickly she responded and I responded back. They did not want to have anything to do with Madeline, even though um, Andrea Emil, who actually has done, I think she was involved in the in the 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 two boys that had murdered the parents. I can't remember the name. Anyway, she did something on that. She's quite well known. Anyway, moving on from that. We then were faced with the McCanns upset because of the documentary being aired and they did not want to aired in Britain. 
and from the Mail Online, uh, they may sue the Portuguese detective nonsense for YouTube conspiracy video blaming them for Madeline's disappearance. Now, what really tickled me when I read this last night is they actually they put a link to the video in that article, but they didn't actually use a screenshot of the thumbnail of the video, our video, and just described it. And that, that tickled me when I saw that because I thought, oh, I wonder, were they worried I was going to get them for copyright or something? <laughs> but, um, yeah, that was, that was just, um, uh, just amazing that they would do that. And so they really wanted to stop the, Okay, here's here's the description of our our video. It's been dubbed in English with a tribute saying many thanks to Joanna Moray in Portugal for the translation. As it happens, there was quite a few people that did contribute to the translation, so I just want to make that clear. It opens with a bold statement, the documentary the McCanns don't want you to watch. Huge red letters then flash onto the screen, banned, emphasizing banned by the McCanns in September, followed by the decision overturned. So they were they were describing our video, and that just that just made me laugh. I guess they couldn't use the screenshot of the video, but they did link to it at the time. So we're we're actually famous. So this is what they um, this is their effort. Uh, to stop the video from being seen. Uh, they, a close friend of Maddie's family added, YouTube videos with lunatic conspiracy theories against the McCanns have sadly been available on the website for years. That's our, our, our channel they're talking about. And no. None of them are lunatic conspiracy theories. Every one of those videos I stand behind as fact. Always have, always will. Um, the, something about silence in them all, but the lawyers will be looking into any they feel are potentially liable and damaging. Now, this was back in 2017, so... You know, we've got uh, three years behind us. Who knows? The thing is, some of it may actually, uh, something may happen. I know that um, Andrea, oh, sorry, Anna S., who translated the French version of the book, was asked to take down the book. So it should not be available online. But this documentary still is, and I thought while it's still available, it would be a good idea. So maybe half an hour later, maybe I should start going through with you what uh, what I planned the video to be about. <laughs> so let me see. Are we ready to start the... Okay, yes, I think I've covered everything else. So let's get going with this. Now, it's all been um, translated, and it's vis visible at the bottom of the screen. Now, maybe you might want to go full screen to be able to see the comments, the translated comments. I did consider at one point maybe narrating over, but uh, no, not. It, it just it just didn't sound right. So if you can't see it, just um, go full screen. And I hope, and I'm sure it will help you and you'll be able to know exactly what Gonzalo Amaral back in 2009 put together for this documentary. So any more questions before we start? 
I don't see any right now. Okay, that's fine. So, first of all, I'll start with the preview, the intro that I did for the documentary, and it's based on the book, on Gonzalo Amaral's book, which uh, was a, it was very successful. Uh, I mean, the, the book and the documentary were just huge in Portugal and other countries, but not allowed to be shown in Britain. And that's because the McCanns, as I absolutely believe, the thing they fear the most is for the UK public to actually see some of the facts. So this is the intro to show you how it's based on the book. Okay, so that's the introduction. And uh, what I've done is split the documentary into something like eight minute segments. So we'll go through one segment at a time. And if there's anything you want to ask about that particular, uh, that you see in that particular segment, then please go ahead and um, save it. And Shirley will maybe put it on the screen after. Is that right, Shirley? I will. <laughs> that always <laughs> makes me laugh, a little two-second delay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okie dokie. So I'm going to start with the first part. And don't forget, if it, 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 the translation is at the bottom. If you can't see it easily, then maybe put it on full screen. And you should be able to read it. So here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Gonçalo Amaral, fui investigador da Polícia Judiciária durante 27 anos. Coordenei a investigação do desaparecimento de Madeleine McCann no dia 3 de maio de 2007. Nos próximos 50 minutos, vou provar que a criança não foi raptada e que morreu no apartamento de férias na Praia da Luz. Descubra toda a verdade sobre o que se passou naquele dia. Uma morte que muita gente quer encobrir. I'd like to say a few words to the person who is with Madeline or has been with Madeline. Madeline is a beautiful, bright, funny and caring little girl. She is so special. Please, please do not hurt her. Please don't scare her. Please tell us where to find her or put her in a place of safety and let somebody know where she is. We beg you to let Madeline come home. We need our Madeline. Sean and Emily need Madeline, and Madeline needs us.
please give our little girl back. Por favor, devolva a nossa menina. No dia 3 de maio de 2007, uma criança que dormia junto dos seus irmãos foi raptada. Esta é a versão do crime que nos habituámos a aceitar como a única possível. Mas será que é a verdadeira? Ou esta versão esconde um crime que muitos querem esconder? Há como que uma, uma necessidade de abafar o caso, de silenciar o caso. Eu recordo que várias pessoas foram afetadas. Polícias ingleses estão impedidos de falar. Outras testemunhas, como os Martins Semedo, também têm, têm algum receio. E várias pessoas, portanto, isto é um caso de que as pessoas, algumas ainda têm medo, ou então estão mesmo impedidas de falar. O que estamos a preparar nunca foi feito. Levámos o antigo coordenador da Polícia Judiciária, Gonçalo Amaral, ao local do crime, para mostrar o que aconteceu a Madeline McCann. Esta reconstituição vai permitir-nos perceber quem falou verdade e quem não o fez. Vamos saber o que se passou na noite em que Maddie desapareceu para sempre. Estranhamente, nunca a investigação judicial foi capaz de fazer a reconstituição daquilo que aconteceu. A reconstituição não foi feita porque houve quem defendesse que isso seria considerada a família suspeita, bem como o risco de fuga. Desde o início que a polícia judiciária foi pressionada para não investigar este caso como qualquer outro. Houve um clima mediático, político e diplomático que dificultaram em muita investigação. Madeleine McCann estava há poucos dias de comemorar o seu quarto aniversário quando desapareceu. A última vez que foi vista em público foi às 17h30 do dia 3 de maio de 2007. A mãe, Kate McCann, foi buscar-la à creche. O registro de saída mostra a hora. Na mesma altura, o pai, Gerald McCann, jogava ténis a poucas centenas de metros. O documento do aluguer do campo e o depoimento à polícia confirmam que Gerald saiu apenas às 19. Na mesma tarde, os amigos da família lanchavam no restaurante Paraíso. As imagens das câmaras de segurança provam que os homens abandonaram o restaurante às 18h13 e as mulheres 15 minutos depois. Um deles, David Payne, foi ter com Gerald McCann ao campo de ténis. Segundo o depoimento de Payne, feito à polícia judiciária, este perguntou-lhe onde estava a Kate, dirigindo-se depois ao apartamento alugado pela família McCann, onde chegou por volta das 18h30. Nos interrogatórios posteriores, os testemunhos divergem. Gerald McCann fala que David Payne se terá demorado 30 minutos no apartamento dos McCann. A mulher, Kate, garante que foram só 30 segundos. Na altura, Kate estaria a dar bem aos gêmeos e a Madeline. Passava pouco das 20h40, quando os nove amigos ingleses foram jantar ao Tapas Bar. O restaurante diz a cerca de 50 metros, em linha reta, dos apartamentos onde permaneciam sozinhas oito crianças. No apartamento 5A, dormiam Madeleine McCann e os gêmeos, Emily e Sam. Cerca das 22 horas, Kate McCann, a mãe de Maddie, deu o alarme. Maddie não estava no quarto. Por volta das 22h40, a GNR de Lagos recebeu um telefonema a dizer que uma menina tinha desaparecido do Ocean Club, na Praia de Luz. Segundo o testemunho da gerente do Ocean Club, quando a patrulha da GNR chegou ao local, o pai da criança atirou-se aos pés dos militares, como rezam os árabes, completamente descontrolado com o desaparecimento da filha. A cena repetiu-se, segundo os militares da GNR, no quarto casal. Passava da meia-noite, quando a GNR avisou o piquete da polícia judiciária. Fui informado de imediato e tomei as devidas providências. Procedeu-se a buscas na região, as autoridades espanholas foram avisadas e as fronteiras controladas. Ter-se-á organizado a maior operação de busca alguma vez feita em Portugal. Durante vários dias, centenas de militares da GNR, bombeiros, voluntários e elementos da polícia judiciária passam a pente fino mais de 200 km quadrados. Uma operação de busca gigantesca. Nenhuma busca em Portugal terá tido tantos meios e tanta gente. Tudo é visto e revisto. As fronteiras são vigiadas. Todo o tipo de veículos são revistados. O esforço não tem sucesso. 
a criança não aparece. Termos provas que, de facto, ela pode ter acontecido pior, nós continuamos a pensar que ela pode estar. Pode estar viva. Como sabem, é, pela ordem jurídica portuguesa, não é só o rapto que dá resgate. Se alguém levar uma pessoa para ato sexual, também é rapto. É nessa base que estamos esperançados. Os pais da criança, Gerald McCann, 39 anos, Katie Lee, 39. O casal David Payne, 41, Fiona Payne, 35. E a sua mãe, Diane Webster, 63. O casal Matthew Ulfield, 38. Rachel Mapley, 37. E o casal Russell O'Brien, 37. Jane Tanner, 36, são interrogados pela primeira vez pela Polícia Judiciária. Na primeira semana, ouvimos centenas de pessoas. A família, os amigos, os funcionários do aldeamento e todas as pessoas que terão contatado com a doença. Desta primeira leve de testemunhos, resultou um esboço daquilo que se terá passado naquela noite. Foi nas costas de um livro de Madeline que, na noite do crime, a família e os amigos escreveram as versões coletivas dessa mesma noite. O esboço serviu para combinar os depoimentos dos nove amigos britânicos sobre o que se passou. Segundo essa versão, que será posteriormente confirmada nos interrogatórios, antes das 20h45, os McCann entram no restaurante Tapas e depois vão chegando os outros casais. O jantar decorre normalmente. Como as crianças estão sozinhas nos apartamentos, as famílias revezam-se para ir vendo se as crianças estão bem. Por volta das 21h05, Matt controla a janela dos vários apartamentos e encontra tudo calmo e as janelas fechadas. Entre as 21h05 e... Ok, were you able to hear that ok? Could you read it, Shirley? I could, yes. Oh, okay. So hopefully most others could, and especially if you put it on uh, um, full screen. Right. And I'm, I'm actually, as I was watching it, I mean, unbelievable what the police put into this. The Portuguese police were, were just um, huge for what they did. But um, I'm watching it and thinking, you know, any time, any time that documentary and our video will disappear. Uh, so this I thought was important to share with you so that you did get an opportunity to see the facts surrounding the case as per Gonzalo. So I don't know if there were any questions on that. It was pretty basic, I think, <clears throat> an introduction. And this is a great way to introduce yourself to the case, of course. You know, if you don't know anything about the case, this is a must-see documentary which we don't know if and when it may disappear so we're here for you <laughs> so if there's no questions then i will go to the next clip which again is something like eight minutes thereabouts okay yeah, there there hasn't been any questions so far yet yeah no i understand that it's uh um yeah it can be distracting okay 21 e 5 e 21 e 10, Gerald McCann vai ao apartamento, garante ter entrado pela porta principal e entra no quarto das crianças. Parece-lhe tudo bem. Posteriormente, Gerald vai declarar que teve o pressentimento que alguém estranho estaria no quarto. Quando sai, encontra o produtor de televisão inglês Jeremiah, que passeia o seu bebê para o adormecer. Fica a falar com ele por debaixo da janela da sala do apartamento. Por volta das 21 e 10, Jane Tanner vai ver se está tudo bem com os filhos e controlar os outros apartamentos. A caminho do 5D passa por Gerald e Jeremiah. Jane diz, posteriormente às autoridades, ter visto um estranho a transportar uma criança nos braços na rua Agostinho da Silva. Às 21h30, Russell e Matt verificam todas as habitações. Matt espreita pela porta do quarto das crianças McCann. Desse sítio, apenas consegue ver os gêmeos. Russell fica a cuidar da filha doente. Às 21h50, Russell regressa ao Tapas. Na mesma noite, do outro lado da aldeia de luz, a família Smith, quatro adultos e cinco crianças, acaba de pagar o jantar no restaurante Dolphins. O talão do cartão de crédito foi emitido às 21h27 do dia 3 de maio. Os Smith vão beber um copo ao bar Kelly's. Não demora muito. São cerca das 21h50 quando se encaminham na direção da urbanização Estrela da Luz. 
quando atravessam a rua 25 de Abril e chegam à rua da escola primária. Percorreram 30 metros e cruzam-se com um homem que transporta uma criança ao colo. Passava pouco das 22 horas, quando Kate vai ao quarto dos filhos pelo caminho mais perto, acedendo ao apartamento pela janela de correr e dá pela falta de Madeline. Garante que a porta e a janela do quarto tinham sido abertas. Larga tudo, deixa os gêmeos e continua a dormir, num quarto com a janela aberta e dirige-se ao Tapas Bar para dar o alarme. É aqui neste ponto que parte comportamento da Kate McCann naquela noite, no 3 de maio, se torna incompreensível. Em vez de parar neste ponto e daqui, no ponto aqui próximo, daqui de gritar para quem estava no restaurante onde estava o esposo, o que ela faz é descer essas escadas e, pelo passeio, percorrer uma distância que é certamente o dobro da distância daqui até, até o, o, o restaurante que se situa aqui a cerca, em linha reta, a cerca de 50 metros. Quando ali chegou, terá gritado a dizer e let down, portanto a menina foi-se a um termo médico, muito utilizado em, em medicina, ela foi-se e depois todos vieram a correr e todos utilizaram outra vez a entrada aqui no, no, no apartamento por este lado. Havia muitas contradições. A mais evidente era estar alguém naquele quarto quando Gerald entrou. Se não entrou, só espreitou, também tem que se levar em linha de conta com aquilo que o raptor possa ter pensado. Se é que existia um raptor, é que o raptor não pode confiar que o pai não entrasse dentro do, do quarto, porque era tentar, portanto, estar atrás da porta era praticamente impossível, materialmente isso não é possível. Não cabia atrás da porta e os armários encontravam-se bloqueados pelos berços. Mas dado o drama que vivia a família e o clima de comissão, preferimos não fazer deles suspeitos. A primeira contradição tem a ver com a distância. Todos os envolvidos, salvo Kate, afirmaram que quando se deslocavam para ver se as crianças estavam bem, utilizavam as portas da frente dos apartamentos. O que significava terem de fazer mais de 100 metros em comparação ao que fariam se acedessem pelas janelas de correr. Apenas os McCann confirmaram ter essa janela não trancada, justificando que conseguiam ver a janela de correr a partir do tapas. Não se percebe que fizesse mais cento e tal metros para ir ver os miúdos quando tinha um caminho mais curto. O pai de médio disse que quando foi ver os seus filhos estava apressado para ir à casa de banho. No entanto, foi pelo caminho mais longo. Vejamos no mapa. A linha amarela é o caminho feito até às portas de correr. A linha vermelha é o caminho que todos os pais afirmam ter feito. Sensivelmente, o dobro. Esta preocupação dos nove ingleses apenas revela receio de serem acusados de deixar os filhos em situação perigosa. De facto, estas contradições podem justificar-se simplesmente pela necessidade das famílias inglesas quererem demonstrar que as crianças estavam em total segurança. Segundo um advogado português com experiência em trabalho com vários clientes ingleses, o comportamento pode justificar-se devido ao receio de serem acusados de abandonarem as crianças ao perigo. O crime severamente punido pelas leis do Reino Unido. Terem sido deixadas pelos pais expostas a situações de risco e a perigos que elas, pela sua terraidade, não pudessem proteger-se e enfrentar e resolver pelos seus próprios meios, é considerado um, um, um risco grave e uma atuação grave e inteligente da parte dos pais. And there we go again, um, focusing on the Smith sighting, which um, it holds a lot of weight to a lot of people, obviously, including Gonzalo Amaral. Uh, for me, as I've mentioned before, I absolutely believe that the Smiths saw somebody carrying a child that night. It could have been Jerry. I don't know. I just have always questioned the fact of him carrying... Madeline, who had just died, and blood was found on the tiles, and yet he was the child he was carrying was not wrapped in a blanket. It just does not ring true to me. Um, but I could be wrong, of course. So I'm always open to that, but it's not something I really discuss a lot. So, okay. 
I see. <laughs> you know, Shirley, what's funny? You've put a message up before, and I was thinking it was one of those adverts. I didn't actually read it, so I apologize. But I see now it's because I've put different uh, uh, settings on here. Um, Palumbo, why didn't the Moyes couple make statements? They apparently were sat on the balcony two floors up of apartment 5A, yet they never heard a, a thing. How is that possible? Um, yeah, I'm familiar with the Moyes uh, family. And hmm, I'm just putting two and two together here. Is, is, is the Moyes family the one that had a little boy that was supposedly playing with Madeline, or have I got them confused? But always keep in mind, that the statements made uh, to the Portuguese police, we have those statements. However, there are some statements which were not official, and we know that by the uh, the sailing um, chap. Uh, uh, again, I know the name, and it's just gone away from me. Uh, that they didn't make official statements. They su supposedly saw Madeline that day, but their statements are not in the files because they didn't make an official statement. And as far as the Leicestershire police statements go, uh, a lot of those have not been released. So there's a whole lot of things which we don't know. And that's why I always say we probably know about 5% maybe of what actually happened that week. And, but I, I think we can be rest assured that as far as the Portuguese police go, they visited houses, they interviewed everyone, even claims by people that they didn't interview Mrs. Fenn, etc. Of course they did, but it was not an official statement and so therefore was not included in the files. So it's important to keep all that information uh, known, you know, that uh, we, we, we know very, very little about what happened. We can only work with what we know. And, but Gonzalo's, this documentary is just so important and I hope it's okay. I don't know whether or not you would rather just do um, half the documentary today and maybe another half another week. Um, but certainly I think it's important for everybody to see it before it may disappear. And that is, that is a, a possibility. Uh, hence I'm, I'm doing this right now. So anyway, let's, so I, I I'm sorry, I couldn't answer your question, Palumbo. I'm not, uh, um, I would if I could, but timelines of my things and I, I admit that I know a lot about the rest of the case but not every specific thing and, and uh, hopefully some of our guests coming on in future weeks will have more knowledge of those things than I do. I was hoping to get Isabel McFadden and Sonia Poulton. Both of them have agreed to do it at some future time. Peter Mack who is one of the main, main, main researchers who actually is a friend of Gonzalo Amaral's he um, he is able to come on very soon. I don't know exactly what date. And um, Peter Hyatt, who does uh, speech analysis and uh, uh, will be with us. And I was hoping to get Pat Brown, but she hasn't answered me yet. But I mean, these are the people that know a lot about the case and maybe I, I will contact Richard D. Hall. I, I don't know whether or not he'd be able to, but I'll certainly contact him just in case. I really want to cover the whole case and not just what I know. So anyway, let's move on with the next one. A segunda contradição importante é dada pelo depoimento de Jane Tanner, que afirma ter visto o raptor. Não se percebe como Jane Tanner passa por Gerald e Jeremiah e vê um homem a transportar uma criança, sem que estes dois a tivessem visto nem ela nem o raptor. 
A única explicação possível para não a terem visto é dada pelo depoimento do seu marido, que afirma que ela viu o raptor quando vinha do apartamento e não quando ia para ele. Era de facto possível que ela tivesse visto Jeremiah e Gerald sem eles a verem, mas apenas se estivesse a vir do apartamento pelas traseiras, usando a janela de correr. Em qualquer caso, a identificação pormenorizada que ela faz de um possível raptor é impossível. Vejam com os vossos próprios olhos. Jane Tanner garante ter visto a esta distância, com esta falta de luz, claramente cinco aspectos. Primeiro, viu um homem moreno de 35 a 40 anos, magro, de cabelo escuro até ao pescoço. Segundo, esse homem tinha calças de linho entre o bege e o dourado. Terceiro, vestia um casaco de penas, mas não tão grosso. Quarto, tinha sapatos clássicos pretos. Quinto, o homem ia a andar apressado com uma criança deitada nos braços esticados. Posição mais própria de uma estátua do que uma pessoa a andar com uma criança. As declarações de Jeanne foram a base para a tese de rapto. Mas para nós, e mais tarde para a polícia inglesa, eram de valor duvidoso. Como é possível ver tanta coisa àquela distância e com aquela luz? Como é possível que Gerald e Jeremai não tivessem visto Jeanne, nem tivessem visto o raptor? Este avistamento tem ainda um outro problema. Jane vê o alegado raptor a cruzar a rua Agostinho da Silva e menos de 30 minutos depois, a família Smith vê também um homem com uma criança ao colo na rua da escola primária, do outro lado da vila e a deslocar-se na direção contrária ao homem que Jane diz ter visto. Temos dois avistamentos de potenciais raptores. O problema é que o avistamento do Smith não confirma a visão de Jane Tanner na hora e na direção seguida. O homem que o Schmidt vê está do outro lado da vila. Dirige-se para a zona da praia, transporta a direção ao colo e não com os braços esticados. Mas pelo aspecto físico, podem estar a referir-se à mesma pessoa. Mais adiante, veremos a quem e quem mente. A terceira contradição dos testemunhos é-nos revelada pela janela. Se às 21h20, Jane vê o raptor com a criança... E Kate, quando dá pelo desaparecimento de Madeline, repara que a janela do quarto das crianças fora totalmente aberta. Por que razão Russell e Matt, que vão verificar os apartamentos depois das 21h20, não veem a janela aberta? É totalmente impossível. A janela é a prova da veracidade dos testemunhos. Se a menina foi raptada pelo homem que a Jane diz ter visto às 21h20, então a partir daí a janela estaria aberta. Matthew diz ter estado dentro do apartamento e não ter visto a janela aberta. De onde se conclui que a janela só foi aberta depois do presídio ao rapto. I have been in touch closely over the last few days with cabinet ministers here in Portugal, with the prime minister's office and with the Portuguese police authorities. Mais de 350 pistas foram testadas. We have a very strong sighting that Madeleine McCann was seen in Morocco 12 days ago. A polícia judiciária diz que as próximas horas podem trazer novos desenvolvimentos. Robert Murat é constituído arguído depois de um longo interrogatório nas instalações da polícia judiciária em Portimão. Foi constituído arguído um indivíduo do sexo masculino com 33 anos de idade e residente na zona dos acontecimentos o qual foi interrogado nessa qualidade, não tendo sido recolhidos elementos de prova que fundamentassem a sua detenção e posterior interrogatório judicial. Quando eu tive uma conversa com ele, ele disse que ele admitiu que ele era apenas um homem local, que ele falava fluente português e inglês, e que ele apenas voluntariou para ajudar a polícia com a sua investigação. Ele foi muito fixado, ele estava muito chatinho, tentando... Maybe emphasize some of the parts of the investigation, such as, oh, maybe she's gone to Spain, maybe it's too late. That's a jornalista desconfia dele e nós não fomos atrás daquilo que a jornalista dizia. Nós fomos atrás da análise dos factos, foram, uh, foram analisados os factos, aquilo que, que efetivamente aconteceu, e atrás de um testemunho, de um testemunho de que, para se debilizar, para se avançar com o tese do rap, tinha que se debilizar esse testemunho, o testemunho de Jane Tanner, porque senão uh, a tese do rapto morria logo pela base, no fundo era aquela grande, a, 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 o grande fundamento do rapto era o, o que essa testemunha teria visto, um homem com uma criança ao a caminhar em direção à casa de Roberto Moreno. Talvez as pessoas não saibam, mas ficam a saber é que 
a busca à casa do Roberto Moderato dá-se numa segunda-feira de manhã e no domingo à noite uh, estamos reunidos com o Ministério Público, com o Procurador, com a, Mestre, uh, com a Juiz, estou eu, com o Dr. Luís Neves, estamos lá no, no tribunal enquanto correm diligências da prenda luz, diligências para de, de se confirmar de facto se a, 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 a suspeita relativamente a esse Roberto Moderato e a senhora Jantana é colocada dentro de uma viatura de vigilâncias da polícia, passam várias pessoas, polícias, pessoas que ainda a senhora Jantana não tinha visto, com esse senhor Roberto Moreto então, mas ele diz que pelo andar, pela forma de andar, que era esse senhor. A pessoa que levaria, seria a senhora, a pessoa que levaria a criança ao colo. De facto, a memória de Jane Tanner mostra-se progressivamente mais apurada à medida que o tempo passa. O primeiro retrato robô que ela ajuda a desenhar é um ligeiro esboço. Posteriormente, identifica positivamente Robert Murato como o homem que ela viu naquela noite. Bastantes meses depois, participa num novo retrato robô Lembrando-se já, milagrosamente, de todas as feições de um homem bastante diferente do Morato que reconheceu antes. Outro documento que pesou para incriminar Robert Morato foi um perfil psicológico dos psicólogos ingleses que, em termos muito genéricos, afirmava que a atitude voluntarista durante os dias seguintes ao crime de ajudar os investigadores e a família podia ser uma máscara de um criminoso. Ou são pressupostos teóricos ou são banalidades. Portanto, é claro que eles partem de análises estatísticas, o que se poderiam chamar epidemiológicas, digamos, perante a população, de um sem número de comportamentos que poderiam provocar a suspeita, uma suspeita, suspeita maior ou uma suspeita menor, de um sujeito. E mais nada. Estamos todos muito tristes por aquilo que passou com a Madeleine McCann. Por favor, se alguém tem algum tipo de informação, eh, que nos diga. Faço uma oração especial, rezo uma, no mínimo uma Ave Maria em todo o país, eh, para que isso, que Nossa Senhora de Fátima ilumine eh, as nossas autoridades a que eles possam encontrar essa menina. Tomorrow, we want to visit the shrine at Fatima to pray for Madeleine's return to us. Sunday, we had another offer of more than a million pounds uh, from a, a group. So it included J.K. Rowling, who wrote all the Harry Potter books. It included Wayne Rooney, who is one of our most famous footballers. Uh, I think it included Richard Branson as well. O tempo passava. As pistas do rapto conduziam um beco sem saída. A própria família começou a aventar a possibilidade de Média estar morta. Os primeiros sinais de morte vêm da família. Uh, que sinais mais exteriores, nós já tínhamos pensado nela, mas é a família que contrata um, um ex-coronel, um ex-militar das forças uh, militares da África do Sul, para com uma máquina milagrosa vir àquele local e encontrar o corpo da criança. O sul-africano Daniel Krugel determina um local onde é suposto estar o cadáver de Madeleine McCann, uma vasta área onde nada foi encontrado. Okay, well, before I actually comment on that, I hope you don't mind if I go a little bit off topic here. Uh, the I don't know if you heard at the beginning of the um, one of the uh, segments that uh, I had a, a FaceTime call. <laughs> you may have heard the beeping, and I don't do Facebook FaceTime. But what it was, was a friend of mine, I get about three a year, if you can believe, and one happens right here on, on live. And what it was, was one of my friends from 1961, is the last time I've seen her, was uh, trying to contact me. Uh, so Bernadette, I gave you the link. I don't know if you're here, but thank you so much for contacting me and, and maybe joining us here, I don't know. So that, I just thought, it, it's just so typical of getting calls out of the blue right when I'm on live. So I apologize. I had to turn my phone off. So anyway, regarding that clip from the documentary, I think the thing that sticks out to me the most is the fact about Robert Murat. 
he was targeted by Laurie Campbell. And this, as Gonzalo basically um, pointed out, was the reason that he was included and um, they had to do something about him. He, in my belief, was wrongly targeted. And when I checked into in, into some of the details, what I did note was that Kate McCann went out of her way to basically place accusations against him. They on that night after after Madeline disappeared, she claims that he was there at eleven o'clock. Now, from police reports, he was at home in his kitchen with his mother and confirmed to be on some websites on his computer, websites that his mother wouldn't use, let's put it that way. So knowing that Kate McCann really wanted him to be targeted is of question to me. And the fact that Laurie Campbell really had no reason apart from um, because he was being over friendly to actually place him in the in the uh, limelight. Following on from that, years later, and again, Carrie might be able to help me with the name here because I've forgotten it again. There was a Panorama interview where one where the journalist involved admitted to Robert Murat that he was asked to give information, any information he could. There was so much more to that about, about Robert Murat and he, he denied he, he wouldn't do it, but there is so much going on behind the scenes that is questionable that, um, and my personal opinion is absolutely without question. Robert Murat is not involved at all. There could be others that disagree with me, but that's my personal opinion. So uh, I don't know how others feel about that. Is there anything else on that live, live stream that uh, is something that um, may somebody may question? And we have silence. Nope, I'm just go I'm scrolling back. I know you, you Shirley, you do such a great job. I just laugh <laughs> at uh, I, I just laugh at that little where I can see the mute button and it takes a few <laughs> seconds. Going on and off and on and off. But you do. I mean I you know how much I appreciate you, even though I accuse you. I do. I do. <laughs> I, do. I, do. Mm -hmm. I just love saying things about you but anyway um <laughs> palumbo why would jane say robert murat was the person she's seen when her partner describes seeing robert murat that night but russ describes him wearing different clothing to that of tanaman well that's true yeah yeah that's absolutely true and i think that where that may have come from, there's a couple of, uh, there's a few people that look the same. Once again, name has gone out of my head. David Payne has similar appearance to him. And also somebody to do with the Ocean Club, can't remember his name. He also looked similar. So they could have been seen around. The curious thing about David Payne is that it was quite a few months before we actually got to see a picture of David Payne. And that was always curious to me. But, oh well. Okay, so it could have been, I think it was just a setup. I saw a comment um, about uh, the Smiths, was that a setup? And I don't believe it was a setup as far as the Smiths concerned. I, I, I absolutely believe they claimed what they saw, just whether it was Jerry carrying a child 
through the streets is a possibility, um, a setup in, in, in that respect, or somebody else that looks similar to Jerry carrying a child. I really don't know, but I absolutely believe the Smiths and they've been hounded. And um, in fact, if and when we get Isabel McFadden on, uh, she may be able to help us more on that. She's actually been in contact with Mr. Smith. Uh, so let's hope that uh, she'll come on one day. But she's busy right now. Totally understandable. Revy Green, have you any ideas why the McCanns go to s got so much protection, money, and special treatment? I think we all wonder that. Right from the start, why on earth would they hire high-end lawyers right at the start? It, it just doesn't make sense. And they set the fund up within, I think, about 16 days, and they had these lawyers in place. It just wasn't fitting. There was also the diplomat that recognized when he went out there that uh, something was amiss with the McCanns and taken off the case. And uh, when they, Justin McGuinness was their PR for the longest time until they were made our guidos and returned to Britain. But then Clarence Mitchell, who was the media monitoring person for the government, why would he leave that job with the government to come and be PR for the McCanns? It's all very, very, very suspect. And something which over the years we've all discussed, I can't obviously can't remember and go into detail today, but if there is any any of those issues that you would like me to have a topic on and do a live, that would be absolutely great. I mean, give me inspiration for what you'd like to see and uh, I'll certainly see what we can do. And if I can't answer a lot of the questions, I'll do my very, very best to get a guest on. Um to be able to help me because obviously in so many instances I need help. <laughs> so now what, Shirley, can I get your opinion here? Um, and I, I think, oh, Bernadette. Sorry, how lovely to see you after from 1961. Golly, that's <laughs> 60 years ago was the last time I saw you and here you are. This is absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Actually, I'd suggested to Bernadette that we, um, our old junior school, St. Mary's in, in um, Ponders End in London, uh, she's been trying to get people together to be able to uh, connect and of course, with COVID, that's not been possible. Plus the fact that I'm in Canada, so I'd I'd be left out of it totally. So I was suggesting to her that maybe we could use this opportunity of a live similar to this to all connect and uh, and and go over some of our old stuff. I mean, we all know what it you know when we golly, I can't believe she's here. Uh, thanks so much for <laughs> that. <laughs> And um, yeah, so, and, and Bernadette, keep in mind, we can have nine guests on here and also we've got chat. So that would be a great opportunity and, and maybe something other people could consider. I certainly wouldn't mind helping if somebody else wanted to do something similar uh, to get together. Uh, I think it's great because apart from FaceTime, we've uh, actually, I, I don't know how FaceTime works. I, I just don't do it. But I don't know if there's chat with FaceTime. But with this, um, anybody who doesn't actually want to join can just drop into chat. So I am so, so happy. I mean, can you believe it? <laughs> it is. It's pretty cool. 60 years and she's popping onto my live right now. That's lovely. <laughs> I remember. <ya. laughs> so anyway, I guess I should get back to what I'm supposed to be doing. And... Um, what I wanted to ask you, Shirley, was uh, your thoughts. And I think I know what I want to do here uh, because it's nearly five o'clock. Uh, we're an hour and a half into it. I, I don't usually like to go much over two hours, um, but I also like to have a little uh, 
you know, chat from others and get ideas and thoughts. And uh, what's your thoughts on maybe just dealing with half of the documentary today and then giving the other half another week? What do you think? Or I should think I just continue? Idea. Okay. I, I think that's I, a good I, idea. But like you said, you don't like to make these really super long. And um, Carrie's been putting the link in the chat for people to, if they want to go out and watch it. So if they have, you know, they'll give them a week if they want to go out and watch, watch it on their own and then come back with more questions. Cause it is, it's a lot to absorb, you know? It so, is. um, um, I think, I think giving, I think waiting till next week to finish it would be good. Well, not even necessarily next week, just another week. I mean, because, oh, well, oh, right. uh, yeah, because I, surely we've got other guests that we want to get on. Right. And uh, right. I'm hoping I'm hoping that Peter Mack is going to be available very shortly. I'm really, really pleased. In fact, I I had a message from Tony, and I haven't replied to him, Tony Bennett. He was so happy to see that we had, I think, seven or 8,000 views um, on the video that he was on. And I certainly want Tony back. I mean, th these guests have so much more information than I could ever come up with. And... Uh, it's it's re I'm really quite excited about this. You know, remembering back to the day I decided I wasn't going to do the, the lives. I think yep. you remember that day. Yep. And the f following day, I had a message and um, regarding Chris and Kim. And at that moment, when I realized how huge they were, not how huge they were, but what great... Um, support they were and how important it was to them and I suddenly decided right on the spot I was going to do these lives that's why I recognize them every week they are important to me and I got a lovely email from them suggesting that maybe I could take it further and you know what I'll take it to wherever it needs to go I'll do my best and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to the fact that I've had people approach me to be a guest. I mean, that's pretty special. I mean, me. <laughs> so, so let's just, I, I like to play it by ear every week and, uh, and see what inspires for the next week. So maybe we'll do a second one. Maybe we'll do a second one later, but ultimately um, we don't even need to do one because I think, with half of the video already seen, uh, I think I've played half, but never mind. Um, everybody who's interested could actually go off and watch the rest for themselves. I think actually, you know right. what, that's probably a good idea. And the fact that I took all that time recording and separating and, and uploading the other half is irrelevant, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think people interested and you never know. I think that's a good idea because I really don't like to uh, keep this any longer than a couple of hours. I think that's enough of me. You know, I'm sat here talking to myself, basically. Well, you sometimes, and uh, <laughs> you are a wonderful yeah. conversationalist, Shirley. But um, yeah, you can have too much of something. And I think um, you can never have enough of. Uh, Gonzalo's documentary. So, uh, Sh uh, Shirley, Carrie, lovely Carrie, has put the link in to chat, and I absolutely suggest that you go there and um, check out the rest of it and see what you think. And if you do want me to address it again, then let me know. And Shirley will let me know because I'm sometimes oblivious to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's why that's what that's what we're all here for to help you because you can't have eyes everywhere. No, I can't, and uh, yeah, and and you remind me of so much, and then I still forget. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> what we got here, Martin uh, uh, Ranchcroft. Thank you for doing these. I have watched all of your videos. Great knowledge and insight from Lizzie. Oh my goodness me, how great is that? I. I'm I'm really happy and I I take the um the thingy I I take it personally that you you 
enjoy what I do, but more importantly is that you are watching and looking and seeing all about Maddie. And that's what's more important to me than any personal um, compliment. That's the word I was looking for. Isn't that silly? I keep losing these silly words. So, you know, when I when, when I make a sentence and it doesn't sound right, it's probably because I've forgotten one of the words I wanted to say. But I get there in the end. So, yeah, thank you so much, Martin. Appreciate that. Oh, and Sue, I love Lizzie's lives. That is so great. That's so great. So, Emily, uh, never too much. We can go on for longer. We're all so enthusiastic. Do you know that is so great? That is so great. I I have I started the channel back in the the YouTube channel back in uh, 2011. Back then there were less restrictions for YouTube than there are now. So of course I I question doing videos now um, knowing that there are a lot more restrictions. But when I look back over some things that we've done and I was, when I looked at the um, super injunction issue, I really felt like that deserved a video. But on the other hand, I really don't want to highlight the channel with using those words that will immediately get to the McCann's. And uh, that is an issue. I mean, as silly as it sounds, if I was to put something about the super injunction onto a video, it could really um, jeopardize me. So I probably won't do a video on that. But if there's any other issues about that, maybe I'll address them in a live with one of the guests who would have more knowledge than me on, on things like that. So I think we have to be really careful. And uh, that's what I'm going to have to do is be careful. So you need to guide me, Shirley, in case I'm not careful. Okay. And Shirley always, <laughs> you know what? I always run things past Shirley and Carrie, and and uh, they're really great in giving me advice. And uh, I do listen to advice. Okay. <laughs> no answer from you, but okay. Silly Hopter. Helicopter. Kelly Hopter. <laughs> <laughs> when you do a show on the possibilities surrounding her body being stored, there's a big gap from her apparent death and the hire car. I'd be interested to hear the theories. Yes. Um, yeah, we could focus on something like that. That would, uh, I think, be a, of a lot of interest because Gonzalo has pointed out that her, um, the likelihood of her body being frozen is there because body fluids were found on the car wheel uh, onto the curb. I mean, translations can change actual words, but yes. And then that would give us um, something which Carrie will just think is humorous, is that we could deal with a little cubby, a little, uh, little thing on the side of the trunk of the car where there is an opening directly over the wheel and we call it the little cubby but um yeah we did a, i did a lot a lot of research into that so maybe yes maybe emily we will address uh, sadly um about how her body was moved well michael how do you do michael do you think the upcoming three-part series about the German suspect indicates that there is still manipulation in the case? Are they still trying to influence public opinion? Well, thanks for bringing that to my attention today, M Michael. I, I didn't know that there was something upcoming on this. And as I've mentioned before, uh, Peter Mack, who is friends with Gonzalo and also has had something to do with um, uh, Bruckner's lawyer, uh, maybe somebody that I will try and maybe I should, although he's busy right now, but maybe he'll spare a little time next week. When is it supposed to be on, the, the three-part series? I haven't actually seen it. 
Um, I don't know if anybody knows when it's supposed to be on, but it would be great to have Peter Mac on at some point with his knowledge about uh, uh, Bruckner. Also, here's another issue. Maybe, maybe we could focus on some of the um, clips from uh, Mark Saunakonoko's podcast, because that, to me, um, his new podcast, he had one called Maddie uh, last year, but his new podcast is They've Taken Her. And the first episode has been released, and that's about Christian Bruckner. And Mark actually speaks to, I can never remember if it's his attorney or the prosecutor. It's just incredible. And it <laughs> you, you walk away from that. I think you don't even need to get to the end to realize that it's all a big setup. So... Um, yeah, so that that would be interesting. Fifteenth, oh well, that doesn't give us much time to get um, uh, Peter Mac on before, but certainly maybe I'll look into it and um, see what we can address about it. And certainly, is it on every week or is it just on in a three days? Uh, so I'll wait for that answer. But your lives, Lizzie, attract people who perhaps know little about the case, so they learn more. Also get rid of all the misinformation around, thanks to MSN and conspiracy theory. Well, Kath, Ellison, thank you for that, because as everybody knows, who knows me, I will not allow any information that I don't I can't show a link to the the true the the facts, or I haven't, or or I don't already know that that is a fact. If there's any speculation whatsoever, I will tell you it's my opinion or this is speculation. But I don't I don't agree with giving out information that isn't factual because I think it can escalate from there and become like a Chinese whisper and turn into something else. So what – oh, Michael, you just know it's three parts. Well, hang on. I mean, I've, I've got you on a, on, a, on a case now to check out for me. <laughs> Thank you. And what I was saying was that um, uh, I will check it out on Monday. And if Monday 13th, 14th, yeah, on Monday, and see what – I can see that uh, Mark's podcast could debunk. Uh, that would be maybe interesting to do that next week. And that's why I was asking if it was during the week or whether it was three parts weekly. So we'll, we'll work on that. So I don't know about that. But anyway, talking about Madeline and debunking and conspiracy theories and uh, what we were discussing before is that it's so so important to listen to those you trust. And I did make a comment earlier about Armchair Detective, who still uses Madeline as a basic, um, as one of his, he claims that he's he's got hundreds of videos. Now he's he does have a few. And certainly back in the day, back in 2018, he did ask me if he could use some of my uh, clips, and I did allow him back then. Um, I had nothing against him at the time. This was prior to him making any money on the case. Since then, it's changed drastically, of course, and I'm pretty disgusted with how he takes cases and uses them against um, and makes money from victims, small victims of crime, um, Madeline and also, in the Watts case, the the, the mother, uh, Shanann, and her two children, and uh, the child she was expecting, Bella, Celeste, and Nico. And he's made money. He's hurt the family because of it. And I, I think most of us and many of us here also know what I'm talking about. We are all 
just so disgusted that he should make so much money out of that. But certainly when it comes to Madeline, that, it, that was what drew me to uh, see what he was doing in the first place. He, he was, uh, his claims about being world renowned expert um, and a registered expert, can you believe? There are no registered experts in the Madeline McCa McCann case, let alone armchair detective. The only experts in the case that can be claimed as experts would be Gonzalo Amaral, who was the chief coordinator, the Polizia Judiciaria, who were the Portuguese police, and other people that were directly involved with the investigation. None of us are world-renowned experts from coast to coast. And this is all a big ego trip to make money. So please be aware of that. Anybody who is taken in by him in either case, please be aware that what he's doing is not about, as in my case um, and all the other creators in the Madeleine McCann case, to um, looking for justice for Madeleine. He is looking for money because of it. And again, for those of you who might have missed it, Um, can you just take that message down for a sec, please, Shelley? I won't forget you, RP. You can see here that over 13 years in the big box there, I have not made a penny on Madeline. That's 13 years of hard work, and I certainly have done a lot of research and hard work, and I am proud to have done it, and I don't regret it, and I am pleased to say that I have not made a penny from it. Um, but he has made, is, is currently making something like $20,000 a month. And I, I mentioned it briefly before, but if you look at the $20,000 a month and say, oh no, that could not be possible. Just think about it. He has, he has begged for people to join his Patreon where you have to pay per month and he's reduced and taken away the $1, $2 and $5 levels and only takes in $10 to $50 levels, claiming uh, it's not economical for him to have those. Well, he's got, and at one point he had probably around 15 to 1800 patrons. Now, if you take in, let's just use as an example, 1,500 patrons. And let's just say, although lots of his um, subs are, are very generous, let's just say that they are at fifteen uh, $10 each. 1,500 patrons at $10 each is $15,000 every month. PayPal. He was bringing in, when he was on Crowdcast, before he was uh, um, uh, chucked from there, he was bringing in 15 to 20 people every night on his Patreons and taking in about, I, I mean, I conservatively guessed 100 a night, probably more because so many of them are really generous. But if you count that every night for a month, 30 times 100, that's 3,000. So there you can see how 20,000 a month is not an extortionate amount and probably is more. Now he's managed to get monetization. He gets super chat. I mean, some people, $100 a time, that's one night, one live, an hour out of his time, and he's getting $100. I know they take off 30%. Mm, as far as I know, I think he mentions 40%, but it's not, it's 30. I'm pretty sure. Uh, th this is just outrageous. These children have died at the hands of, uh, well, in the Watts case, at the hands of the father. And, the, and, and Shanann, the mother, died too. And Armchair Detective is making money from this. I, I just find it deplorable. I, I really do. I 
I think when I say I've got passion about Madeline, I do. And, and my passion is not to line people's pockets, not to see people line their pockets from her. But the same goes for the Watts case. It's just deplorable. And the parents of the victims, uh, Shanann's mother and father, the Rusek family, have begged him to stop. They've even got onto a, a Denver Live um, broadcast and begged everybody to stop with these conspiracy theories, which he is he is producing. It is a conspiracy theory. He, he goes on. In fact, tonight he's doing about the red car. There is no red car. It's proved. It's been debunked by a friend of his. It's been debunked. And yet he doesn't make money unless he does these theories. I, I, I guess I should stop because, but this is the man who claims um, some of his um, followers want him to do Maddie. And I, I tell you, if he does Maddie, I will go crazy because he has no right to do Maddie. He has no right to make money off Maddie. And that that is a passion for me, I guess you can you can tell. I should stop, shouldn't I, Shirley? Um sure. <laughs> I have no problem sitting and talking about the scams he does. But yes, if you want to stop, I understand. Yeah, I was just watching, seeing Palumbo. It's not his fault. That's for people to choose to pay. The thing is, Palumbo, what, what we are against, I have nothing against somebody who wants to give him money. That's their prerogative. But they don't mm -hmm. know why, what he's doing to get that money. He's lying. In fact, last night, I seem to recall on his live, um, the the public live, he was making all these claims about what, well, you should see what, what's going to happen on Patreon. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do the other. Please, please join Patreon, you know, get. And when his Patreon started, he was just busy chatting with somebody and answering a few questions. It was like clickbait to get yeah. them to join. He's got so many manipulative techniques that his followers do not see. Um, we can see it. And in fact, when I say we, we include a lot of members that used to follow him and have learnt and realised what happened. Uh, they've had people, I mean, one in particular, um, Summer, and uh, she used to give him... Uh, thousands hundreds thousands or when i say that you know over time they yeah. just donating and what happened to her she had a patreon where she claimed to have been able to use um the uh have an input with the book as a board member and as soon as she tried to have an input he wanted nothing to do with her and he blocked her um this is all uh, we've got all this this is what he does if you give him money he's your friend if you don't give him money then you're blocked and he hides everybody almost in a cult-like manner behind and he's claimed it behind a fort we're gonna build a fort around us it's just like an abusive well i find it very abusive to do that where none of his members are encouraged or able to see what are the facts and so they are oblivious until they find their way out and then they find their way to us and we hear from them and we hear some of the sad stories. We really do. So this, if you are considering following him on anything Madeline McCann, please be aware that he is not one of the credible um, people in the case. In fact, if you go into our Facebook group, Heidi Ho Controversy, uh, we will not post any videos that have any connection to money. Um, if anybody has any s suspicions of making money, whether it's Patreon or, or whatever, then they are not welcome in our groups. And we do that to this day. So you can be assured that anybody that we, we, 
highlight on Heidi Ho controversy, you can be sure that they are wor a worthwhile watch, you know. Can I just say something also really quick? Um, uh, everybody has a right to their opinion. In. Um, and I don't think for most of us, it's been necessarily the fact that he's making money. I mean, it is. That's a fact. We don't. That's not OK. But um, he's been asked to stop um, yeah. with the with the Madeline stuff. That's a different thing. But um, in this particular case, he's been asked to not not even just stop. He keeps saying he was asked to stop talking about the case. That's not true. He was asked by the family just stick to the facts. I could sit here and list. 50 things that he has said just atrocious. He made up injuries to to the to the children in graphic detail. They were all lies. He's got um hundreds of people that on site, if they saw Nicole Kessinger, they would probably hurt the woman. I mean, so he's it's not just about the money, because I know like some of the people in the screens. I, I just want to add, you're talking about the Watts case here. Yes, the Watts really. case. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then, to, you know, some of the people in the chat about, you know, hey, if that's the, they're right. I agree. I actually think it's it's great. Fine. All, all those people want to be that stupid with their money. Give it to him. Great. But what he's doing is he's inciting a whole group of people. I mean, they've had people out there hiding in bushes, taking pictures of people. He's had he's had subs do that. I mean, he, he's it's not just that he gets on there and he makes up these lies. The things he does, and he has said this before, words have, have meaning, words have power. Well, so do his. And he has some really, really not very mentally stable subs who are out there doing things on his behalf. And and I'm just going to say, for me, he's dangerous. He's a dangerous human. Has nothing to do with money for me. Um, and the, the Maddie stuff, I know that, that that was a whole different thing um, from what I've understood about that. Most of the and I'm doing air quotes right now, the knowledge that he has about that, he took from everybody else. The, the man didn't do his own research on it. He looked, he, he took it from everybody else. That's what I've, I've come to understand. Okay. That's my two cents. Well, I mean, you know, your two cents is great because this is the whole point. We all have our own story. And I mean, I, I focus more on the money end originally because that is, what took me on to checking out what he was doing because of the Madeline case and the fact we didn't make money and and all of a sudden we saw him making so much money from Madeline and I was just disgusted and I actually did uh, at one point tell him to please don't discuss Madeline um uh, none of the community would be happy with that now he did stop he did refer to was someone doesn't like me. But I mean, he called us 30,000 housewives uh, and tribes. He was disgusting towards us, saying we didn't do anything, that um, if he had the support, and use uh, air quotes on that one, um, he could solve the case, basically. It, it 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 really is outrageous and i didn't want to actually bring him onto these muddy lives and i'm keeping this portion to the end as opposed to the beginning where i just gave the details but when i saw Lars, i mean it's not just last night he's been quoting maddie every now and again and about his book the non-existent book may i add and it won't be it won't be in existence because many of you have actually helped him with it. It was just basically posts that were unreadable, un couldn't be understood. None of his posts were actually his words, even to this day. He still has people doing all his work for him. That, uh, again, is... <laughs> just... <laughs> I can't say any more on that. So, yeah. So, um, David McChesney, Lizzie, through your hard work and facts gathered from the Maddie case, which is incredible, do you believe that one day justice can happen to allow these facts and discrepancies uncover, uncovered be revealed? Well, I do believe that we will get justice one day, as does Gonzalo Amaral, one day. 
as far as my discrepancies and uh, the research that I've done on the case, do I think that will solve the case? No. I, I believe that the Portuguese police have everything they need. What I am trying to do is point out to the UK public who have been prevented, as you can see by the fact that the McCanns didn't want this documentary shown in the UK. And had it not been for everybody who put together to do the translation for this documentary, none of you would be watching it either. And this is all the work that's involved. All of us have put our effort into it. But as far as my research goes, it's more about helping understanding about the case and seeing how questionable the McCanns are. <laughs> Excuse me a second. I've got a question up there from Linux Doss. Um, so, do you all think the McCann twins know the real truth? Sorry about that. I I swallowed okay. down the wrong way, <laughs> and I couldn't <laughs> even speak <laughs> to ask you to take That's it. That's okay. Away. And I'm not sure if I finished what I was saying, but uh, hopefully I was close to it. Uh, do I think all the McCann's twins know the real truth? Well, we do know that Sean did enter into a conversation on some of the uh, groups, uh, um, et cetera, a few years ago. And as I've mentioned before, I don't want them to know the real truth, quite honestly. I really don't. I, I would like that they were just in belief of what they've been told, uh, you know, for them. I, I, I really do. That's what my gut tells me. So I don't know if that's an answer, but... It's the best I can come up with. Uh, yeah, they, they probably will have questions, but you know, I think, I think there's, there's something weird that happens between families and people you trust is that you believe what you're told. You, you want to, and you have to, um, it's just something about it. And and as I say, to be honest, the, the twins do not deserve to have been within this situation. And if it if it took one of us to explain to them to the, the truth, really what would they gain from that? I they wouldn't. I, I don't think. I I would like them to be totally oblivious and to carry on their lives um as they as they have it. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I just feel that way. They're children. Even when they're adults, they may see the truth. But for now, no. And that was from Cat in a Hat. Yeah, they're, they were too... Uh, there were two, 20 months, I think, at the time. So that's close to two years. So now it's nearly 14. So they're 15, 16. Yeah. Yeah. So they're getting old enough to think for themselves. And um, it's up to them. It's up to them. I just feel quite, quite passionately that they, they do not, they, they, they sh they can maybe find out for themselves, but I don't think anything should be pushed upon them to change their minds. I really don't. I don't think them. Uh, Carrie, our oh, dear Carrie, thanks for all the links, Carrie. I don't think the McCann's expecting the internet to go the way it has. Information is easily found now, so they may look into it more. Well, that's true. They may look into it more. But when you mention about the fact that the McCanns didn't expect the internet to go the way it has, I absolutely believe that that was the biggest thing in this case. John Bonet case was prior to a lot of the internet stuff. But when this hit, 
this was before Facebook. We didn't open our Facebook groups until 2012. And um, that prior to that, we had the forums, we had three A's, we had the mirror. Um, the mirror had a section on it, uh, which was closed down just a couple of days after I mentioned about. Uh, Oh, I'm not even going to say it because I can't remember her name again. <laughs> um, yeah, th there was all those forums. So we were able to discuss it. Three A's being the biggest at the time. And uh, I, when you think that the McCanns had no knowledge that all this was going to happen and that, that they wouldn't have the scrutiny. So you kind of have to keep in mind that that night and the decisions they made were not made according to being scrutinized. They thought it was just going to be a little case in Portugal, maybe. And uh, the police were not very good. I mean, this is what they claimed. They didn't realize. They didn't realize the huge extent of the police investigation and the huge amount of activity on the forums and subsequently Facebook, Twitter, all the rest. Sandra Mullins. Thank you, Lizzie. If it wasn't for people like you, we would still be in the dark about what possibly happened and Amaral's great work. Yes, there's, there's lots of us. It's not just me. I, there are so many. I, I wish I could name over the 13 years the people that have been involved in, uh, in, in helping everybody get the information and a couple of weeks ago, I think, when um, we've sadly had to say goodbye to Tanya Hobnob, who was a huge person in putting out the information. And also along with that, I mean, a lot of people will remember Ironside, still Magnolia, the same person, Linda, who died. Um... I mean, still Magnolia. You can still go to her blogs. She was posting almost up until her death. And Ironside, she was known as on Textusa or Text USA. I don't know how you would say it. Uh, she was often there giving. She was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. A really sad loss. And uh, all the other people involved in, in the case. I mean, just recently, and probably on the next portion of the documentary that I haven't shown, is Dwight Levy. And he was, uh, he was uh, a big part of the case in as much as, from what I understand, he got us the dog video um, the dog's video, the hour and a half. I mean, it was a, it was a, a long, um, the, the dogs were, in, uh, were videoed every day over the course of their, everything was videoed, but he managed to get an hour and a half of the dog's videos. Now, also, he had access to a lot of the original statements and things like that. And I was actually, had uh, my last message to him on Twitter was I was trying to find out about Diane Webster's statement if I could get a copy or if he could let me know about the original um, audio from her statement to see whether super injunction really was what was said, injunction being inaudible supposedly, but I really wanted to find out. And he was the person I asked him, but he wasn't able to help me and sadly he passed away a few weeks ago so i mean there's so many people that have been huge in this case all the translators i mean can you, any of you imagine if those translators hadn't taken the forty thousand maddie case files and translated a huge proportion of them over years we wouldn't even be here discussing because uh, uh, unless you're Portuguese, you wouldn't know what you were discussing. This is the thing. It's it's one thing for somebody like me to be able to uh, do the videos and, you know, in this case, lives. But 
I mean, there are so many people that need thanking for why we were able to do this. Okay, RP. Uh, beyond the terrible tragedy of the death of an innocent child, Madeline, I find that the whole case sets a terrible example of what certain Britons can get away with abroad. Well, I, yeah. When you say certain, I mean, in this case, they absolutely did. And, and again, why? Why have they been able to get away with it? It was clear from the start to everybody who didn't just blindly listen to the British media. I think most everybody else knew there was an issue. And yet it was covered. It was hidden. And this is why... I believe at some point that this super injunction was in place. I, I really do think that's a possibility. And because the super injunction may be in place, as was uh, alluded to on, uh, on Diane's uh, statement, we, we wouldn't know because nobody could say, yes, there is a super injunction. This is part of the rules of the super injunction. They can't even claim it exists, never mind what's in it. It's such a huge thing, but I think I'm going to ask um, one of my guests uh, that come on their thoughts on that statement because it, it claims the capital S super inaudible. What else could it mean but super injunction? Because they're discussing about the fact that they can't talk. So I think almost without question, there is a super injunction in place. And if that's the case, and you were to say to somebody, is there a super injunction in place? They couldn't tell you because it's against the super injunction rules to even refer to the fact that it exists. Now, I've just remembered, I was in conversation with Mark Selnokonoko. He was partic in Australia and the one who did the podcasts for Madeline. And he was interested in that, and what we weren't at the time sure whether Australia would be part of having to be, whether or not they could get past that. So, you know what, I think I'm going to contact him again and see whether or not, because if he, and they are in the process of doing some more podcasts, um, the following on from they've taken her the, the the one episode that was released he's he's doing more um I wonder whether or not they could go dig further into that I, I know he'd be interested because he was interested before but we'd pretty much got through most of the podcast at that point so maybe a little reminder I think uh, that might be worthwhile yep not Mark's the person to go to he's great by the way love his podcasts and him too he's such a lovely man and and i just missed that i just missed that one shirley was it something i addressed or no they're just comments I'm yeah. putting up. yeah okay yeah they are extraordinary and uh yeah john Bonet too uh thank god for those lovely generous people who gave the time to translate the files and all the fb pages that keeps the fairy tale abduction questioned yeah and and uh, name name wise there are a lot of them that all joined in from the maddie case files and i maybe maybe um Kerry can put up the link for that because they deserve to have the uh, people recognize them I don't think they're too active right now, but you can find the files and you can find, oh, some extraordinary um, reference information. And also Astro and um, Kazlux and uh, a few others put together every single news article in chronological order from 2007 onwards. It's an extraordinary, if you want to know what happened on any day, you can check it out and have all the information and all the articles available. I, it's just extraordinary. 
and uh, also the reference. I know Kazlux did a lot of uh, reference on there, but they were the people that were originally, along with other people involved too. So Astro, Kazlux, Inez, and um, Joanna, Mora Joanna Moray were the people that I could name right this minute that were involved in the translations. I mean, Joanna did a heck of a lot of work. She's got, uh, if you can check out her her YouTube channel. And in fact, the intro that I did for tonight was on her channel, which I kind of pinched from her because I didn't have time to ask her. <laughs> oh, don't tell her. <laughs> I'm sure she wouldn't mind that. So, and she originally did the documentary and she gave me permission to use it, so. Yeah, you're only doing this on the internet. No one will know. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm it's sure you're fine. But... It, it, it's a good job I don't tell any of my secrets on here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, as long as just as long as, as, long as Sophie isn't around, I'll be okay. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Something about her makes makes you just open up and start talking about all kinds of weird stuff. So um, <laughs> just to let you know, Emily, ha, she yeah. said it earlier, but you were talking about what the video. She just wanted to say that, you know, she's willing to come up and um, discuss anytime that you want. And RP also about the dogs, the timeline of the dogs. Oh, OK. Well, thanks, Emily. That's uh, that's good of you. I um, I've steered clear of of. Um, guests for a little while because I really wanted to focus on the topic of the time and uh, but I'll certainly keep it in mind and thank you so much for for the offer I'll, I'll uh, certainly take you up on it so yeah I think one of the uh, I think one of the, the the sequences that I haven't shown on the from the documentary one was about the dogs just incredible just incredible and that was that was RP that offered to discuss that, the timeline of the dogs. Okay. Thanks, RP. I, as I say, just uh, Shirley will remind me. <laughs> <laughs> over and over to. and over. I, ha I have <laughs> to keep reminding you because if I don't, then I'll forget. So that's why I do it. Not for you, but for me. Otherwise, I'll forget. So Yeah, well, I think there's a lot to do with reminding me because I – I, I don't know. I never have enough hours in the day. And as much as I try, um, simple things. I mean, I'm the worst at replying to messages. I really am. And I do apologize. And just, I, ju I just get overwhelmed. And I'm happy to be overwhelmed. I mean, crikey, at this time, am I lucky to be somebody that uh, my daughter, actually, it makes her happy because she doesn't have to worry about me because I've got so many things happening. I've got so many friends on the Internet that she doesn't have to worry about me. And uh, and that's nice. Yeah. And, yeah. you yeah. know, it's it's I'm really happy. Well, I, I don't know about you. Do you think um, maybe we should uh, call it a day? Oh, we've gone over our two hours, Shirley. Yeah. So I think maybe that. That should be the case, and uh, we should put it aside till next week. Same time, same place. Don't know what we will discuss next week, but I do want to thank all the mods for sorting everything out. I want to thank Harry for sending the links, and of course you, Shirley, for... You're welcome. For being You're my welcome. right thank hand you. man. <laughs> and thank you for doing this for all of us. And Claire, too. Claire's in there and Helen's in there. And Claire and Helen and, and yeah, you see, well, I can't always see chat easy. And yeah, yeah. I mean, just, just the mods, you know, you've got Hannah yeah. and Suzanne and all of them. Um, Hannah and Suzanne haven't been here today. I'm sure that they've got other things going on, especially oh, Suzanne. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I Hannah. Think, Hannah, yeah. Hannah lost a fur baby today, so she's, I, I, yeah. she's dealing with that. Yeah. So thanks, Hannah. Even though you're not here, Hannah, we're thinking of you and and Suzanne too. It's, uh, you know, yeah. this is the thing. We all have important things that happen in our lives, and I mean, 
Carrie, she struggles with what she's going through right now, and she's still here passing out links. And Helen, yeah. happy thoughts. You know, it, it's I am such a great community. I'm so lucky. I'm so, so lucky. I mean, I could be, my, my daughter, I think, thinks that, oh, mum's probably sat at home just, look i don't know watching tv well i don't have a tv so i can't watch it but you know it must be worrying for for her until she knows now what uh you know what's involved and how involved everybody is and how i've got such great people around me and i got so much to do i can't uh i can't keep up but i do want to say again i'm so lucky i've got a great family and I've also got a great sister who's 82 today. So happy birthday again, Anne. 82. And the only thing that I am mad at you for is because you went along and cut my hollyhocks when I was seven years old. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Still holding it against her. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, but apart from that, I, I, I don't recall any time falling. I, I don't recall my my brother, my sister-in-law, who I've known all my life. Absolutely lovely. And I don't recall ever really falling out with them. And my niece is my niece and my nephews. And they're just, I'm just so lucky. I'm so lucky. So oh, never mind my son and daughter, of course, who we actually, we, we rarely fall out as far as i can recall but anyway okay enough for me let's um and, and bernadette oh. thank you bernadette this is so exciting I, you're probably gone by now but thanks anyway so sorry so really really quick um rp uh you said you have facebook uh, did you join um lizzie's facebook group oh sorry did you join lizzie's facebook group if you did, then I'm in there. I'm not a mod or anything in there, but I'm in there and I can find you in there. And then um, we can um, message. There's oh, I no. Didn't you, I didn't you realize can't you put were in, the links in. I didn't realize you were in HDH. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good of you. That's good of you, Shirley. So I'm just, um, I'm just trying to um, hook up with RP to discuss because this was supposed to happen i'm not i'm not throwing you under the bus lizzie but this was supposed to happen weeks ago <laughs> but just trying to get hooked up with rp um <laughs> she's she, she's been offering to to discuss things with you for quite a while <laughs> okay oh is that raquel yes oh it's raquel hi raquel yes i have spoken to raquel for pereira is that the one well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you're doxing her right now. <laughs> I don't think you are because I don't think you are because she told us in here. But I'm just like, um, I don't know. <laughs> I I will find you in there, um, okay. and I'll send you a message, RP. I'll send you um um a message through Messenger on Facebook then, and we'll we'll get something figured out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Guess I should get <laughs> going. <laughs> Because I thought that was the name from before, you know. So anyway, anyway, let's move on. And um, yeah, so we're going to end it right here now. Oh, look, they're all wishing you happy birthday from to Anne. I'll make sure that she sees that. So because I was, doubt um, I'm not sure. There was somebody else. I can't remember her name, and I apologize. It was earlier. She said it was her son's 10th birthday today, too. So I can't remember. She's still in here. Happy birthday to your son. Oh, that's that's cute. I, I, I would sing happy birthday, but this is kind of, you know, my sister had to go through it, but I can't really put anybody else through it. So happy birthday to your son. And... Uh, and we do like to remember and think of people, you know, I think this is, this is one thing is that we're, we're very casual on here. As you know, we're, there is no, um, we're not professional and, and don't intend we ever will be, but I think what's important is that 
we we care about the people around us and and who's around and uh, you know we're constantly thinking of some people who need a little thought and prayer so yes they know yes, who they, they are. are yes they do Okie doke. So I am going to say goodbye for now and thank you so much, everybody. And thank you for putting up with me. And thank you, Shirley, for what you do. You're my right hand man, but you are, well, what can I say? Couldn't do without. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could, but it would just be different. That's all. <laughs> well, you know what? That was, that was funny because yesterday, sorry, I'm going on, but yesterday I, uh, I put out the live and Carrie got back to me and she said, Lizzie, you've got some typos in there. So I had to go back and do the typos. And I said, Carrie, what would happen if I didn't have you around? And she said, you'd be putting out lots of typos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is true. So, okay. So it's it's going to be, I hope I've remembered everybody. And it's going to be goodbye from me and goodbye from, from Shirley. Oh, was I supposed to jump in? <laughs> you know, it's easier if you can see someone because then they look at you and you're like, oh, my turn. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Um, okay. And the, oh, have, have, have a good weekend. Have a good week. I'm not sure where you are, what time it is, where you're at. But um, thank you for coming and we'll, we'll see you guys next week. Okay. And stay safe. Thanks, mm -hmm. everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.